Okay, now we're all set up. All right, so this is module three. And so what I wanna do is I wanna pack together a couple of different things and let me pop up Canvas just so we can all make kind of sure where we are at. There is not. We didn't have any immersive last week either, did we? We did not. Um, not all. Not not all modules or all classes will have them in there. Um, you know, it definitely you will see them in like lab classes, like our general machining classes. They'll have them in there. Um, but that's really that's really going to be it. This these ones are just kind of additional ones. So the kind of the way that it goes is when you're working in immersive and really with all of our assignments, they're they're heavy in the beginning because there's the expectation of you knowing nothing. And then as you progress on, a lot of that stuff's the basics information, and now we're just building off of it. So no reason to do the assignment again, but we're we've covered it, we're we're done with it. By the time you get to 104, you should have no book work at all. Like you should just be going out. Here's your project. This is the time. 104 is really built to help you to understand. Um, this is the project. This is the time you have to do it. You know. And then 103 uh, gets to be it kind of the lead into that. And then 119 on the CNC side, same thing. We're just going to say this is the assignment. This is the time that you have to do it. By now we. have Everything that you're going to see in that has been something that we've covered, but no reason to continuously do assignments over and over again. Only ones that we do all the time over and over again are the things like safety. So, you know, and, and really, if we don't, somebody's going to get their finger cut off and say, gosh, if you would have had me do one more immersive assignment on safety, I probably would have not cut my finger off. So, yeah, we're actually talking about doing away with OSHA up there. Yeah. So, um, takes up like a couple weeks. It does. That's that's one of the big problems with it is, um, like we we covered a ton of stuff in PMI, and that just took the first essentially week and a half, two weeks. That way we get everybody acclimated, we get all these things done, and but yeah, other like OSHA 10 takes a long time and is it doesn't have a lot of huge benefits to you. So we're always trying to look at what what it is that we're doing and, and how it plays out for a benefit, you know. So we are in module three. We're going to talk about service finish. We're going to talk about metals and alloys. We're going to talk about heat treating, uh, measuring hardness. Uh, we have a hardness testing lab, and then there's a module three quiz at the end of the week. This week we only have three days: Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So. Um, we will, we're going to combine some of the stuff today. We're going to talk about surface finish um, right away. Um, and then as we work kind of out of that, we're going to talk about metals and alloys. And we'll look at the book, this book here. So either you need to have this book in your hand, or you need to have the PDF version of it in module three. Okay, so you don't have to have it in your hand right this second, but we will be going through it. And I will be asking you questions about, um, 6061 aluminum, what, what some of the characteristics of it. And so you're going to need to tell me some of those things. And it will be beneficial. So we'll talk about surface finish first. And so it's really important that everything that we have and everything that we do has some type of way of gauging it. Surface finish is typically measured um, micro inch, micrometer, or RMS, root mean square. So there's a couple of different ways of um, measuring surface um, surface finish, and um, anybody know what this is called? Surface finish reader. Don't say surface tester. Okay. It's got a scientific name for it. It's a it's a meter, and it essentially is measuring the Micrometer. profile. Micrometer. The profilometer. So uh, essentially, it's, it, this is just a, this is from Mark Federal, which is really brown and sharp. Um, and it's, it's just a, it's a probe that extends out. And um, you probably can't see, you can hear it. So it just finger goes out, finger comes back in. Measure service finish of a 
whatever it happens to be. It has um, micro inch, micrometer. On the side of it also has a one, three, and five. One, three, and five is how far this thing is going to go out. The further it goes, the more accurate that you're getting. So it's distance wise as you're measuring. Um, this one's real simple. Almost all shops will have something like this just to gauge um, service finish. Um, it, it's really to kind of settle the dispute. Because before this was a thing, this was a thing. So this is a surface finish gauge as well. Has anybody ever seen one of these? So it's metal and it's got a plastic backing. And what you do is you run your finger and it'll cross it. And so if you're looking for a 125 micro inch finish, you're like, and then you touch your part, and that feels about like 125. But you can see there's a lot of variation in that, right? And if your part calls out for a 63 and you're like a 70, you're like, that's pretty close, you know? And, and so like there's this, there's this ability to kind of um, adjust it or adapt it. And so um, I only have three of them. So you'll take one and just kind of pass it through. Uh, that way everybody can see. I've got a fourth one, which is my own personal one, but I have misplaced it or it's been borrowed um, and will surely return. So, um, so we're going to measure surface finish. I got a lab for you guys to do today, and I want you to show me that you know how to use the pocket surf, so propylometer. Um, sounds um, sexual, but it's not. Um, and then you also need to show me that you know how to use a surface finish plate gauge, okay? I'm going to add in uh, hardness testing at the same time. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different parts that you're going to check for surface finish. I've asked for you to find me something that says 850, 126, 500, 253, 450, and 30. So um, what do you think? Higher the number uh, rougher surface finish or lower the number the rougher, sur rougher surface finish? Higher the number the rougher the surface finish. So 500, gravel. Three. So it's the opposite of like sandpaper. It's the opposite of sandpaper. Yeah. Yeah. So like this whiteboard, pretty smooth. Put my propylometer on it. Seven. Pretty slick. Right? Um, and so if you do the table. Um I'm trying to find something with some texture. Um, um, so this is some texture. Okay, how about this? I got this two by four here. How high will that thing reach? Once they stop after like I don't know how crappy of a surface finish can you get. If it goes too high, it's just flashes H. So I don't know what the high number is on it. Probably goes to at least, I think it goes to at least 250, 500. I work. The highest I've seen on it is like 110. Yeah, that's probably the most important. That was like, it's um, like three cutting over something. Yeah. So uh, oftentimes, smoother isn't always better. So certain things are, are requiring a rougher finish if you're going to glue a gasket to it or something has to smash into it or sometimes I'm going to talk to your secondary operation. So a lot of times we would say smoother is better, but smoother isn't always better. What the print says is what we are to go to. So if it says 63, 63 is what you're going to go to. If it says 125, 125 is what you're shooting for. Now, if there is a, a way to lean, probably I'm going smoother is better. Okay, um, so if I have, if it calls out a 63 and I'm a 60, probably not too worried about it. If I'm an 80, I'm probably a little more concerned about it. So um, knowing application is, is beneficial in knowing that. So, um, so we're going to look at surface finish. Um, and so using those two gauges, we're going to look at surface finish. Also on the hard gauge that you have there, it's, it, it, the surface finish is different if it's a turn finish it's a mill finish, if it's profiled, if it's plain, if it's ground, or if it's flat. So you want to kind of look at the process or what the print says. Now
Now, for our lab purposes, it's just find a 125, find a 250, find a 500, not a four lap finish. For some of you guys, you don't know what that means. So we were just looking for just the number itself. All right, so um, now let's talk about how we measure hardness value. So typically our hardness value is gonna be primarily uh, rated by Rockwell C. So Rockwell is the standard ABC all the way through, um, not to Z, but uh, they got several different ones that you can, you can go for. Anything that we cut, which is gonna be primarily in the ferrous, non-ferrous family, um, is going to be um, somewhere on the Rockwell C scale. Aluminum, brass, um, some of the non-ferrous ones, depending on how hard it is, you're going to fall into the D scale. C scale is the standard for most hardnesses. So if I say, hey, this is supposed to be 55 Rockwell, I don't even have to tell you what it should be. Okay, C is the standard. If it's something different, if I say it's going to be 55 Rockwell A, which would be uncommon, um, then, then you'll know that it's something different. So if I say, um, you know, Austin, uh, turn all these parts to 35 Rockwell, or go use some material out there, some 52-100, some 41-43 hard, make sure that it's 35. And so you would know that it's Rockwell C. Now, so you gotta be able to test that as well. The way that we test hardness is done a couple of different ways. Uh, it, it's done a couple of different ways, but it's really all the same way. So we have here, a portable Rockwell hardness tester, uh, which is the same as these two back here. Uh, these are just on a permanent scale, and the other one are not. Have we, have we used this? Have, did we use this in class yet? Okay, we will. We're going to work on it next. Had a little deja vu that we had already done that. So this one is portable, and it's really slick. It's only got really one downside on it. Uh, it doesn't measure anything less than one inch of thickness. And I put a little label on there. It says, do not check anything less than one inch. Reason being is that the way that this uh, hardness tester works is um, based upon um, a bounce. So what I've got, I've got a little marble, ball bearing kind of thing in here. here. I go here, pick the bearing up, hold this down, or release the bearing. And so what it's doing is it's measuring the bounce that it does with the bearing inside of there. When I get to something that's shallow or thin like this, it, it doesn't work. It, the bounce is jacked up on it, you know? So like if you, you put something on there that's sprung, it would be able to tell this doesn't work. So I've tried to check things that were like something like this. It's about three eighths of an inch thick. And it's just not very accurate. So that said 47, I'm not sure. This is 62 Rockwell. So 47, 62, that's a mile, mile apart from each other. So um, just to get, kind of give you some perspective, Cold rolled steel, hot rolled steel, um, like no heat treatment process to it at all is about Rockwell five and under. So um, not like you can bend it, but it's soft. Uh, you've seen already kind of file go into it. Um, something die steel hard is about 60. Um, that's 60 is about the top of that you would go to, maybe 62, but that's on the ultra high side, ultra hard side of it. 65 is almost unheard of. You start to get too hard and you'll have fracturing and chipping. So there's a happy medium. So it's kind of like, um, like you ever have, um, so like who likes spin crust pizza? Okay, do you like it like, you, you like it hard and crispy, like crackery? Yeah, I do too. Um, but then like next day, microwave, even though it's still that same crust, it's, it's just not quite the same, right? It's like it's got that sogginess to it. But the sogginess allows it to, like, if you want to, if you want to fold it in half, it's easier to fold it in half when it when you microwave it, right? So like if you fold your pizza in half, like you've got a big piece of pizza, 
fold it in half and eat it that way. Um, you could do that after it's microwaved, but if it comes straight from Domino's or wherever you get your pizza from, I'm not endorsing any particular pizza place. I eat anything. Uh, when you do that with that hard crackery crust, it crumbles and breaks in half, right? So what happens is, is the hardness value of that is just too brittle. And so same thing for us is we, we, don't want, we don't want something that's too hard and brittle to go out and be used on a bridge because as somebody drives over it all the time, it's going to it's going to break, right? But you also don't want something so soft that as people go on it, it's going to it's going to you know, bounce and loop. So you got to find that right hardness value of it. You can turn or mill something um, that is already hard or up to about 45 Rockwell. Anything higher than that, you're going to need to switch into the higher carbides or higher ceramics um, in the ranges for that for cutting. So anything that's like 40 Rockwell, 35 Rockwell, regular insert's gonna turn it. Um, anything after that, even if, you know, whatever the heat treat process is, um, you're gonna need to move into something else for it. Typically when we do that, um, if we're gonna build a die or something like that, we would rough cut it. Uh, I would encourage you in all of your milling and turning to rough cut then finish cut. Uh, there's a real tendency to wanna turn this diameter, turn this diameter, turn this diameter, and you turned all those diameters, then when you take it out, it's gotten hot and cold, and now it's like doing this. And so I would encourage you to rough, 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 finish, 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 as you go across there. And your parts are going to come out way better and more concentric as you do that. Same thing goes for heat treatment. So if I've got a part that I'm going to use as a die, I'm going to rough cut it on its, in its soft, normal state. I'm going to then heat treat it, draw it, quench it, whatever I call that process, then I'm going to bring it back, surface grind it, remill it, EDM it, whatever I'm going to do to it afterwards. Uh, that way it's more stable in that place. Because if I heat treat something that's hard, or if I heat treat something that's already turned aside, it's no longer going to be that size. Material, say let's just say round parts, um, are typically going to grow about a thou per inch. So if you have a part that's 20 inches, you can expect to have about 20 thousandths growth on it. And that might be great for the outside, right? Because you can always turn that back off. But if your hole in the part is at 18 inches, and now it's 18 inches 20, it's too big. So you gotta leave, you gotta know how to leave your stock. Okay. So um, like if I'm doing a ring that's 20 inches, 18 inches on the inside, I might leave 50 thousandths on the inside, 10 thousandths on the outside, knowing that it's going to expand and leave me with about 25 thousandths on each side. So so you kind of kind of be able to read that material. And so is anybody a woodworker? Yeah, Jeff does a little bit of, of woodworking. We, it, when you deal in hardwoods, and not like deal, like drug deal, but like when you work with hardwoods, um, then you're going to find that like certain wood has a tendency to bend, bow, and flex in certain ways. And like if you take all the material off of one side, uh, you pull it off the planer and you're like, it's like a canoe, you know, it's all bowed. And, and so, so metal is very much the same way it's got a grain structure. So you want to make sure that you're paying attention to how that goes because metal will do that same thing. When you guys get out on the mill, uh, especially on the mill, you'll have a tendency to want to put a part in, quickly fly cut one side of it, flip it over, and take all the material off the other side. That is a terrible way to go. That, that leans into the opportunity of it bowing up or bowing down. So um, take even amounts off of everything, rough, then finish. Okay. So... Um, this is, this is pretty hard. So this is our test piece and it is 56.7 on the Rockwell C scale. I'm going to set this down here. So I got 58. So you get about a point or two, a point, point and a half as far as, um, tolerance on it. I'll pass it around. You guys can take a look at that. Uh, that'll do different types of materials. Uh, different scales, but it's different than that. It's the same but different than those back there. See, those are permanent Rockwell um, testers, and those are digital as well. And so let's just say we're going to use this guy right here. This has been heat treated, and so come back here with me, and we're going to Rockwell this guy.
So generally what I do is, is there is a charger on one of them all the time. When I come over to use one, I will grab the one that is on the charger, I'll move the charger to the other spot, and then I'll turn this one on. So there's two in here, and then there's two outside in the shop that are completely identical. So every, all of them are just the same. So the way the Rockwell tester works, you've got these interchangeable plates. So I can use, I can do this big plate. This big plate works good for something that's big and flat. Um, if I got something that's round, I'm gonna use something like this. Because what I don't want to have happen, if I put something round on here and I try to walk Rockwell, it will shoot out the side of it and hit me in my fragile bones, okay? And so you wanna make sure that you've got a good hold on this thing as you're, as you're Rockwell. Okay, so I'm gonna lay it down when I Rockwell it. What do I, which way do I want to rock well? This way, this way, this way, or this way? This way. Okay. Typically, I want to go with my lowest value, with my largest surface area outside of it. I want to find the area that biggest mass. Okay. So now, if this had a big chunk cut out of it or corner, I would adjust how I did it. You know. Uh, I see what you're saying though, as far as you getting you get density this direction. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna set it down, I'm make sure that it's good and clean. If I have tested it before, I wanna make sure I don't go back into that same little div. I crank it all the way up, really slowly. It's got a diamond tip on it. It does have a diamond tip on it. Once it gets all the way to the top and makes that sound, you know you're where you should be. You can then push the release that way. Make sure that it stops completely. You'll hear it. It kind of sounds like it's releasing pressure. It kind of goes because it's releasing pressure. And then you can pull it back. And then that's your reading on the Rockwell speed scale. So almost 59. Is that hard or not? Yeah. It's hard. Yeah, it's super hard. Um, it's hard enough that if it were to be used <clears throat> In a functional die or punch system, probably see, I wouldn't be surprised to see it not last as long as something that was about 56, 57. 56, 57 has a little bit, it's not quite as hard, but it's got a little bit more longevity to it. So, what do you guys do for your alls? 57, 58. Yeah, 56, 58 was always kind of our common standard to be at. We always try to hold it 56 because it's easier to return. Um, they were always trying to push us to get up to 57, 58. Absolutely. Yeah. And which really, when you're talking about that, like you're, you're talking about the movement of one single number, one single number can change the amount of time that it takes you to return this, remill it, regrind it, do whatever, by a couple of hours. And uh, also maybe the difference between um, a month's worth of die life versus two weeks versus a, a die life. Honestly, most of the time, somebody's going to blow the thing up before it wears out. You know, so it could be 45. Some knucklehead's going to leave his Allen wrench in there. <laughs> okay, we'll start over. You know, so it, it off, a, a die oftentimes does not um, just wear itself down. Typically a bolt or something fell out of it. Well, some, some, somebody double hit it. Something, something happened. There's a weird piece in there for some reason. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's your wedding ring, man. <laughs> you know, come on. I hope your finger went that. Exactly. Yeah. Allen wrenches. Um, over at Maxion, a lot of their stuff's upside down. So the socketed cap screws come out often, you know. And um, and they also, they, they're heavy hitters. Uh, they're cutting through about 5 sixteenths weight material a lot of times. And um, they'll just shear the head off with one inch bolts all day long. Um, so just from pure pressure of just the stroke. So um, they have one inch socket head cap screws. The heads are just being broke off of it and they'll fall down into the die. Um, company I worked for, which that was awesome because that's how we made our money. So, I mean, honestly, a, a breakdown for them sucked for us, but that's also how we got paid. So it was all right. All right, who wants to try this? 
Jim. Come on, you're right here. All right, do what I did. Okay, just like that. You keep cranking it up. You're going to watch that little meter go up. It's going to keep going up until it gets to the top. Now these will do, you can do like three rapid movements and three rapid measurements and the average of the three. Uh, that portable one will do the same thing. It'll actually, if you hit multiple hits on it, it'll just know, are you trying to take an average? And it'll start averaging for you. So you do, it'll say one, it'll say average of eight hits and it'll go through an average one. All right, so after you're done, when you pull it down, uh, this handle's back, it's reset, ready to go. Who wants to try it? All right. We had the dial for years, about two years ago we got these. I almost kept one of those um, just because, but these, these have the ability to do A, B, C. Um, they also do some other, they do a couple of other things, and so it was just easier to move into just this. So what what Brunel hardness? Like so Brunel hardness is typically um, anybody in here welder, everybody's machines in there. Um, so Brunel hardness is typically your real mild steel, your A36 plate, stuff like that. So it's your it's your low hardness. So if I were to take a piece of so would that even be 1018? It would be 1018, but it's going to be when you're at almost zero, uh, it's it's hard to get any kind of readings that are different. So the difference between an A36 plate and 1018 is probably about a half a point all the way down to zero to one scale. So it's really hard to tell. So the way the Brunel scale works is really crazy. Um, you take a ball bearing and you essentially are going to take two pieces of metal and you're going to um, Put that ball bearing in there, and then you're so the bearing is going to go on in between a known piece of metal and the piece that you're going to test, and you beat it with a hammer. And then when you take it off of there, you measure the imprint of the known piece versus the imprint of what you checked, and then you do a little bit of math, and the difference between the two is the Brunel hardness. It's great for field work. So if I'm out welding pipe and I'm like, I think this pipe might be hard. And I filed it, but I'm still not sure. Um, I can take that right on the end of my pipe, hit it, measure it. It's going to take me a couple minutes, do a little bit of math, and I'll be like, oh my gosh, this stuff's way too hard to use. Or it's not, and I just suck the weld, you know, so whatever. Or typically you're not going to notice it in the weld, but you notice it in the grind, you know, when you're trying to belt the pipe or something. You're like, gosh, this piece looks really hard. So um, I've got what they call a teller banel. And um, that's pretty. That's pretty common. That's a pretty common brand. Um, and so they're, you know, the great thing about it is its portability. You know, um, and when you're real low soft softness scale, it's important to use something that measures softness well. So um, you don't, you're not going to use a Rockwell tester like we have for cheese. You know, I mean, because. It's going to be zero every time. It's just not going to be a good standard for it. Do you, do you think they measure the hardness of cheese? They uh, totally measure the hardness of cheese. Absolutely. They're measuring the hardness of everything um, because it's one of those standards that you're doing. So when you're making cheese um, or whatever might happen to be, um, you're looking at consistency. I mean, you don't want your yogurt. You don't want to open up your yogurt and be like, pour that junk out. Or you don't want to have to chisel it out. You want it the right hardness and consistency. So it's the exact same thing. All right, one more person for the Rockwell C scale, and then we will move on to um, an A scale and some other stuff. So uh, it just shut off. So we're going to restart. If 
that has holes like this has on top of it, you want to try and stay away from the hole. So I would do, I try to do the counterbore side up, and then so the pole would be the space between the holes. Yeah. The you can bring it to the other side. Yeah, you'll see the simple thing go up. Uh, you might be too far. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're not jacking a car. Um, so yeah, just. So the uh, penetrator on a maybe you can get not diamond isn't always the thing that's used, but it's primarily the, the thing that's used because it just it just stays hard the entire time, you know. Um, and you you'll see sometimes that they'll use other kinds of jewels. Sometimes you'll see carbides, but an industrial diamond is is the cheapest and easiest thing to use. I mean they're they're hard and they're plentiful. Like you buy industrial diamonds and stuff. Like you buy one of these. It's not the kind of thing you want to make your girlfriend or boyfriend's wedding ring out of, you know, really. It's basically exactly the same thing you use for the rest of the right? It's 100% the same thing. It's, it is diamond. It's just industrial diamond, so it doesn't have clarity and stuff like that. So it's just going hard. But yeah, they use a, um, you know, an epoxy, epoxy in there. So yeah, so. All right, let's uh, continue to talk about cheese. I do not. I do not like. I I cannot figure out who in the world would like cottage cheese. My salsa He's got an end of my cottage cheese next to my burrito. It was fantastic. Something you wouldn't have thought. Yeah, you're 100 percent right. I'm gonna make it. Bro, <laughs> when they make cottage cheese, yeah. I will eat it. Um, it, it looks, looks too gross for me to eat. It looks like it's wrong. Like it looks spoiled. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's like this looks bad. If you want to try it. You know, which I've, I mean, I've been known to do that. I mean, somebody's been like, hey, is that a burrito in the trash? I'm like, yeah, I'll eat it. You know, I'm at, I ate a chewed up cookie out of someone's mouth one time. I mean, I, it was, it was, you know, I got five bucks for it or a dollar, I don't know, something. But I mean, I've, I've done some weird stuff. Pop out a little coolant? Shot of coolant? Oh, yeah, I'll, I would drink a shot of coolant, that's for sure. Or mm -hmm. Waylube or Anna Russ. Um, you just need to have a clear path to the bathroom. It's a great way to make some money, though. So um, we did that in the shop several years back. We were all much younger. And we were like, hey, I bet you can't drink this coolant or a or whatever. And I was like, I most certainly can. Are you familiar with it? What's that? Like, push the black part down. Yeah. Don't push the button. Oh, don't push the button. Yeah. So you're going to load up the ball. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. I imagine it has some kind of collet. That it grabbed it, and when you push the button, it opens the call it up. Um, no longer on. <laughs> All right. So we were talking about softer things, measuring them. Um, not always are we going to be cutting steel, aluminum. Um, there are often times when we will cut things like uh, plastic, nylons, phenolic, so phenolic like circuit board material, um, a lot of other, a lot of other materials. And so there's just different hardness levels of cutting those too. So um, in the ranges of plastic, you or rubber, you have durometer, and so we have a special gauge for durometer. And so it's a digital shore A scale day gauge. It's got a little needle in the bottom of it, so be careful for you people who have dainty skin. Um, and so these are just different gauge blocks on it. So this is the 87 on the durometer. Um, every time I measure it, I measure it's about 84, 85. So um, it's a little bit off, even though I zeroed it out. Um, so I go all the way down here to purple. Purple is 27. Yeah, I get 20 and a half, so pretty close on that. Um, so, like I said, it's not always 
steel that we're cutting. If we work in something that, say, in a place that does plastics, rubber, if you may, if you work at a um, skateboard wheel factory, um, then durometer is your standard scale that you would use for everything because that's how that's how skateboard wheels are measured by durometer. So, um, and turning rubber is really really hard, and so uh, really really difficult. Let me say it like that. Uh, that's not how you make skateboard wheels, but if you were to. I have made skateboard wheels like that. It's not, it's not a good thing to go. Okay, so those things are going around. Make sure that you touch and play with both the uh, A scale for durometer and the preload on the uh, uh, Rockwell tester, portable Rockwell tester, and then um, you'll also need to make sure that you know how to use the Rockwell speed tester back there. You're going to be in groups today of probably twos, and through that time, you're going to need to be able to check those things. Okay, so let's move into just knowing what some of our materials are. Knowing how to use a reference book is very, very valuable uh, to just know how. Not you don't have to have all memorized everything memorized. But you have to know what is in certain materials. And so um, Alro Steel is here in Sedalia. They have been great partners with us, meaning that they sell us things. Um, and so they gave us these books. They gave us all that they had. And I said, I really need more books. And they said, well, we'll get more books. We'll give them to you. So I've got like six or seven or eight of them. They gave me the PDF of it. So what you have is you when you start to look at the book, you've got it listed out as far as steel grades. Um, Steel structures, plate, um, steel pipe, and tubing, stainless steels, and aluminum. So color coding. And um, so we can look at the way material comes. So if you ever have to buy material, and, and chances are, as you're working in a shop, you're going to come to a point where hopefully you're at the place where you're purchasing or at least quoting materials. Okay. The idea typically in the shop is that we are going to move up to a spot because by the time that you're 50, you do not necessarily probably want to be working on the shop floor. It's way easier to have a desk job at that time. So the more you start to think about, okay, how much steel do we need? How much aluminum do we need? How much brass? How much steel? All these things that we need are going to start to tell us this. So if I go all the way just to in the beginning, starting at 1-12, I start to see uh, in my 1018, which is my low carbon. So, so on the welding side, they would call it carbon steel. We would call it low carbon steels. And so 18, 1018 is non-heat treatable. It has no alloys in it. I know that because the first two numbers are 10, meaning it has no alloys in it. 18 is my last two numbers. That's my carbon content. My carbon content is below 0.3 or below 3.0. So it does not have enough heat treatable carbon in it. It has some in it, not enough to do anything. So we can see that these cold finish flats, okay, so they're not round bar, they're not square bar, these are flat pieces. They're cold drawn, so that means that they are smooth on the outside. The difference between the two, you have hot rolled, you have cold rolled, or cold drawn and hot drawn. Cold drawn has a better stock finish, but is more likely to warp than hot rolled. Hot rolled, if you don't need hardness, can be machined much easier, and um, and it, it's less likely to bend or bow because it's already been normalized and essentially annealed. So it's actually softer. So if you've got a project that you need you need to heat it up and bend it or do some stuff like that, hot roll is your is your friend on that. If you have something that you just want to have a nice stock surface finish on it, cold roll is your friend on that. Okay, so we have different different kinds of those. They come in 12 footers. If you move over to 118, uh, 1 18, so right there in the beginning of the book, uh, you see our hot rolled flats, hot rolled in the 1018, 836 range. This is our low, low grade um, hot rolled flats. They come in 20 footers. So cold roll, typically coming in 12 footers. Hot rolled steel is typically coming in 20 footers, depending on what it is. Then we move, okay, so let's go to 124. Gives you your tolerance. Even on your materials, you want to make sure that you're paying attention to tolerance. 
if you buy your stock, um, so say you buy some two by four and you need it to be two by four, it's going to come in oversized. If you need on-size material, you can especially purchase on-size material. But typically, you have a plus tolerance on your material so that it cleans up two size. So the idea is that we're we're cleaning up two. Um, we're going to clean up two. Oops, I need to go back here. Um, to get to two inches, to get to four inches. Okay. Um, next, if I look over at my structural steels, that's all my angles, my channels, uh, my bar, uh, any kind of I-beams, um, any of those types of things, anything that's got a shape to it. And so um, if you flip over to 2-2, two -two, uh, it says angles, bar size, and then the ASTM number of 836, and it says pickled and oiled. Does anybody know what pickled and oiled is? Embedded. So it's it is embedded with oil, or it's let me say it like this: it's dropped into oil while it's hot. Yeah, it's going to be rust preventative. It sucks it into it. So um, steel is very much like skin. Not exactly like skin. Was that anybody else not seen that? Okay. Um, it's poor. Yeah, it's got pores. So. Um, that's that's why on the welding side, uh, you want you're trying to grind down to clean fresh material because you get so much so much of your porosity comes from some type of an inclusion or some type of debris that's inside of there. Yeah. So you want to make sure that those things are out. So typically when you're grinding down to some clean metal, you've got something. It's not like it's different. It's just it just doesn't have the debris on it. So I mean, steel gets drug through everything. So. So. so okay. If you're Milling something pickled, is it so saturated that you know if you're gonna mill or whatever is getting hot, it's gonna. So if you're burn. milling something that's pickled, typically your first cut of your fly cutter or your end mill is gonna be smoky. You know, like if you were to dump rat stuff on it. Yeah, so. yeah. But then after you get through that, um, just sit up there. Um, after you get through that first initial 10, 20 thousandths, you're good. It's gone. Yeah, it'd be different than like what we talked about oil light. That oil light was something that was impregnated all the way through with oil, so it's a bearing. Oil light's typically in that aluminum bronze category. Oil light's a brand name like Kleenex. All right, um, let's see. We talked a little bit about galvanizing, but galvanizing is um, you see a lot more of zinc plating now. Um, Go to 3-11. At the top of it, it says free machining plate, low and medium carbon. It's 1144. It ha it's, it's an alloy because it's got the numbers been changed from 10 to 11. And it's 1144. And if you look down there at the typical analysis, uh, carbon content, or C, is 0.4 to 0.48. So if average is 4.4, that's where you get 11.44. Is that heat treatable? Yeah. It's, it's above three. 3. Yeah, anything above 3 will heat treat. Now, I don't know that I see a lot of stuff that's heat treated 11.44. Um, above the analysis, it says typical applications. Cams, dies, gears, machine ways, molds, sprockets, all things that would be or have the potential to be hard. Um, then you have versions of that afterwards. Um, then you have anything from tread plate to all kinds of other things inside of there. Um, let's look at Let's go to 5 2. This is going to be our stainless steel grades. And so, stainless steel grading is slightly different. 
uh, 5-2. So it should be right at the beginning of your stainless steel grade. So every one of these, I think, I think every grade gets a sheet. Um, anything from 201 to probably up to 600 grades of stainless. Uh, 440, 17.4, and 74 is where it stops. So on all of those grades, if you look, so just look at 303. Um, typical application, bolts, bushings, nuts, shafts, parts produced on automatic screw machine. The screw machine is like a lathe, but insanely faster, a billion times faster. Um, look at that, look at the, the chemicals that are in it, so typical analysis. Chrome, nickel, carbon, manganese, silicone, molybdenum, and sulfur. Chrome, nickel, manganese, all high alloys, high wear resistance. So you know immediately when you see something like this, it is going to be more difficult to machine, but it's not necessarily harder. Okay, so there's a difference between hardness and toughness. Stainless steel often has oftentimes has toughness but not necessarily hardness. You said that comes from the nickel and manganese? Mm -hmm. So your your chrome, your nickel, and your manganese are um, dense materials but not necessarily hard. Okay, so it's the difference between... Um, so if you try to hit it at a higher cut, it looks like they're chewing the whipper to chip off. Yeah, you're definitely... So yeah, let's just talk about it like that. So in turning, you're oftentimes going to see your chip tearing rather than chipping. Like, I can cut a piece of um, 6061 aluminum way easier than I can a piece of 316 stainless, even though they could, potentially, they don't have the same hardness value, but they could, um, because stainless steel is, has this density factor to it, you know? Um, so it's like, like you could punch jello, or you could punch brisket, right? Like, they're just two different things. I mean, like, you could, you could the jello just doesn't have density to it, right? It's like, it's like water. That's why you can eat 75 pounds of jello and just be like, ah, oh, feel bloated, and you sweat for 30 seconds, and you're like, I'm starving. You eat 10 pounds of brisket, and you're like, I need a nap, man, you know? Density, okay? So um, we want to really pay attention to things like that. Um, so that means when I drill, turn, mill on things like stainless, even if they don't have a hard hardness value, you've got to reduce speed and feed because if I'm trying to push through something that has um, immediate resistance back to me. Okay, so it's it's it's, it's a much harder. Um, chrome, nickel, manganese, chrome and nickel especially are going to help us keep some rusting to happen. Um, can I 201 or 303? Can I heat treat it? Carbon content is pretty low, right? So 0.15 and um, point, yeah, 0.15 on both of them. So both of these and, and several of our materials have silicone inside of them. Silicone becomes less of our friend as time goes on. Uh, the more impurities that are in it do actually start to have some effect on us. Sulfur is our friend. It does help us be a little more freer machine in our, in our material. So we actually are okay with some of those things. A lot of your cutting fluids are sulfur-based cutting fluids. So sulfur is our friend, even though it smells like rotten. Um, okay, so keep going up on our stainless grades. <clears throat> Typically non-heat treatable in some of these lower grades. Uh, definitely though, our stainless steel can be heat treated. Um, and it can also be magnetic, okay? So sometimes you might look at your stainless or just to have this assumption that stainless doesn't rust and it's not magnetic. It's not always the case, okay? So a magnet test is a great indicator if you're trying to pare something down into a zone. If the magnet doesn't stick to it, pretty good chance that it's some type of stainless steel. But if the magnet sticks to it, it doesn't mean that it's not a stainless steel. Okay, so it's not the absolute rule on those kind of things. So you want to pay attention to that. 
Because at some point you will grab a piece of material and you're like, is this stainless or is this just a piece of really nice HU that just came in? They look really similar and you don't, you don't want to mess those up. So make sure that you get it right back there. Um, let's see, get out of the stainless and move on into, let's move into the 6-11. Um, maybe... Change my mind. Um, six dash two is where I want you to go to. So, in our world of aluminum, we cut a lot of aluminum here, um, typically because you, it, it's it's just a little. When your speeds and beads are off on your milling and turning, it it helps you to give you some time to start to get things right. Um, we used to cut a lot of steels and stainless steels and hard alloy steels, and, and you will once you get up into 104s and 119s. But in the beginning, um, it's it's better for everybody if you're cutting something that's a little bit free machining and just it doesn't destroy stuff. So. I've heard down on like state tech, they do like wax. They do. And then they like remelt them and stuff. They do, yeah. yeah. So they're not real machines at all. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, that's just, that's just a fact. Um, so there's there's a machinable wax. Um, we actually have a ton of it here. Uh, there are these blue uh, little machinable wax pieces. You know, you can run the same end mill. Well, you could you could machine a piece of wax with a bolt. It's too really hard. You no, know? I mean it's like things that they make dentures for a lot of braces. But I don't know whatever you do with it. Um, there's also um, a Another material that's called Ringwood, and it's like a, it's kind of like a phenolic, kind of like a circuit board. Uh, and you can get it in dimensional sizes, two by four, four by four, whatever you want. It, it, again, it's really soft. So with that wax, did you use it in the CNC machine to say test it for it? Sure. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they'd be great for something like that. Um, the problem with that is I actually want to see what happens to you when you crash something. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I, I actually want to see how you react to that and how you recover from it. And the thing about when you've got some machinable wax out there, um, you can mess up and it it still could look okay. Like, you, like when it, like, so my 135s were out machining this morning and they're making their chest pieces they're working on their rook. And um, one guy clearly was not doing well. And the whole world could hear it. Wah, wah, you know, chattering everywhere. He brought it in, and everybody's like, that looks really cool and trashy, you know, because um, it just wasn't right. Now, machinable wax is not going to give you some of those indicators of chatter. So you hold your part out too far, you, you're, you, you get chatter in the real world. Machinable wax isn't going to give you chatter. So I want, I want to make sure that you can see what some of those things are happening. I also want to see... I want you to see chip load as your chips are coming off. Oh, those are the good chips, those are some bad chips. Machinable wax isn't going to do that. It is a great, I'm not saying it's bad. Um, I'm saying state tech's bad. But I'm not saying machinable wax is bad. I'm saying that, like, aluminum is just the next step up, and it tells me so much more about you while you're machining, when you're machining it. So, uh, and, I mean, I, I did, it, like, that machinable wax, if I have a dimension off, I could I could hit it with my pocket knife and bring it into size, and you know I don't want to do that. Um, okay, so you go anywhere from about that 2000 series up to about the 7000 series. I have some of all of those series here on in stock. So uh, 6061 is what we cut primarily. Um, so it's it's what they call a low grade aircraft uh, aluminum. It's really just aluminum, just standard aluminum. Grade. There's nothing special about it. Uh, 6061. And if you look at the description of it, generally selected where welding or brazing is required, um, particularly high corrosion resistance in all tempers. Formidability um, is excellent in zero temper. Um, and so it's just going to tell you. A little bit about it and where you might find some of those applications. Um, 7000 series is your toughest and hardest 
alloy um, in the zones of aluminum or in the family of aluminum. But even though that aluminum at 7075 is hard aluminum, it's soft, okay? So it's not, it's not high rock low value, it's hard in the family of aluminum, okay? So I've got some 7075 out there. I bought a gray or a piece of every gray two years ago, and we've just been using it for some projects. So that way students can kind of feel the difference between some of that. Um, but just remember, it's, it's, it's soft in its ranges. Um, let's see, I don't know if there's anything else that I really need you guys to see in here. Um, maybe we'll look at, we can skip down to 7-1, uh, which are um, copper, brass, and bronze categories, sometimes called red metals. There is so much aluminum. There's a lot of aluminum. Yeah. And, and the thing about aluminum is, um, like, they're doing things with aluminum with anticipation of people using them for all different ranges. So, like, I bought a whole bunch of one-inch uh, one inch square aluminum tubing this year for some projects that I was working on. It was all anodized because they know that a lot of that, of that size aluminum it gets used for furniture type stuff. So, they're going to pre-anodize it keep it from rusting and to give it a hard coat on the outside. So they're trying to anticipate what do most industries use these things for. So that's not what I use any of mine for. But that is what a lot of it is used for. All mine went to my boat. And okay, so um, you next move into red metals. Um, copper, brass, and bronze is the family. Um, and so they are versions of that. Uh, so when you look at things like copper, brass, and bronze, know that those families can integrate, they can crossbreed with almost anything. So aluminum bronze, because it becomes AMCO, uh, lightweight, high, high wear resistant. So you can take, you can in, embed or impregnate copper, brass, or bronze into steel, into aluminum, into anything else. So it's, it's soft. And it has um, some really good properties. Okay, if you go all the way over to um, 8 1, 8, 8, that would be the last chapter that we cover up here. Oh, no, we'll talk just a little bit about that. Um, starts to look at your alloy and your tool skills. This is really going to be in the, in the range that most of you guys will find yourselves. And so like having a book like this in your toolbox would be a really good thing to have. Your machine or handbook will tell you these same things too. Um, this just happens to be a product book that kind of tells you about what's current. So if you look on 8-1, about the third category down, it says um, AISI 41 slash 41L40. So that L on there is leaded. And so you can buy 4140 and that has lead added to it. Why would you add lead to a material? Make it a little bit. It does make it a little bit sir. Anybody else? Make it radiation. It does make it a little bit heavier. Radiation? Toughness? Could be. Possibly. Or back to softer. It, it, more, it more makes flexibility. It does make it more dura, um, has more durability that way. Um, it's freer machining. If you ever get a piece of 41L42 versus a piece of 41, just regular 4140, it turns like chrome. And it's really a small amount of, of lead that's been added to it, but it just, it just is beautiful. Um, obviously, in California, it causes cancer. Um, but everywhere else it's totally fine. Every other state it's totally fine. So, um, but you know, you want to watch things like that. You know, it's not respirator need, but I mean, if you cut it all day, every day, you'd want to think about a little bit of probably health concerns. Um, so 4140 is a real great, the great thing about 4140 family, it's easy to heat treat. It heat treats pretty fast. When it heat treats, it gets hard, really hard, really fast. So um, you can buy it pre-hardened. So anneal 4140 is about Rockwell 10. 
pretty hard is about 2032. Um, when you get it hard, uh, so heat up with rosebud or put it in the oven, gets really hard, really brittle, really fast. And so I use I used to use this example all the time with my heat treatment allergy class. Um, you guys run a heat treatment allergy, were you? No. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I use the example of the fact that this guy gets um, a bunch of 4140 tubing or gets a bunch of tubing from his boss um, and decides that he's going to make his uh, young daughter a swing set. And so he's a decent welder. And so he goes out and he's got this lake out behind his house and he's like, man, this would be great. Let's kind of in the south so there's some alligators and stuff. And um, so he builds this really, really sweet swing set. It's got the little thing that comes off of a little clubhouse and everything. And so it's his daughter's fourth birthday and he comes out there and he's super proud of it. He painted it all up. It's pink. And so he um, gets his daughter out there and walks outside. They have a big old birthday party and just surprise her. Bring her out there and he's like, check out the swing set that I made for you. And she's so ecstatic about it. And so he gets out there swinging her on it and she wants to go higher and higher and higher. You have to go. And so as he's swinging her, um, doesn't realize this, but as he built this um, swing set, he welded all that 4140 tubing and all of it got hard at every single joint. Like brittle hard. So, you know, really high, gets that really big push, you know, like not not, not to flip over, but don't be really hot. Uh, top tube of the swing set cracks off. She flies out into their lake, uh, is eaten by an alligator, and he killed his daughter because he did not pay attention to the stuff that he was welding. So you are ultimately responsible for the things that you weld. That's not a real story. Yeah, that's, that's just, you know, I saw tears, saw some tears coming down. So um, I tell stories for a living. So. Um, but uh, that story's gotten refined over the years, so it, it was rougher in the beginning. But um, so, like, you're responsible for the stuff that you do, uh, the stuff that you weld, the stuff that you machine, the stuff that you put together. Um, so if you have a piece of 4140, and so let's just say we're building a brown part. Side view of the round par is like this. So it's got a step on it. Um, like front view of it might look like this. Um, and so if I have a part like this and I send it to heat treat, I can almost guarantee if a crack were to form, it'll form right here. It's, it's a joint that in, invites cracking. So if I'm going to do something like that, oftentimes I will radius. The corner here or I will undercut the corner here so I can have a radius in there if I have a sharp corner I'm almost always inviting a crack to happen if I've got five or six hundred dollars invested in this thing put it to heat treat or I send it out to heat treat it comes back cracked I'm gonna start all over again and so time and money and so I want to pay attention to those kinds of things so those are things that that is the expectation of the person who is making the part it will not say hey on the print um, you, you may not have a lot of experience, so make sure that you put some undercuts in this or leave some radiuses in there. The person who wrote the print, made the print, drew the print, has the expectation that you as the machinist know those things. That is your responsibility to know that. Your boss may or may not tell you that. doesn't matter if he or she tells you that. It is your responsibility to know those things. So you cannot pull the no one told me card. Because if I'm your boss and Cameron is like, crack three of these after making them $1,500, I am furious. And his box might be sitting at the front door when he comes in the next day. Um, chances are he screwed up some other stuff anyways. I mean, yeah. Um, so, but I, I just, you know, that's, that is just really important to know those kinds of things. Um, I mean, you may work in a shop, but that never comes up. You may machine low carbon steel and just cut key waves all your life, and so that's totally fine. But in the in the chance that that isn't, at our shop that wasn't. We were it was something different every day. You never knew what you were doing, you know. So um, you just had to be prepared for those things. I mean, we spent a lot of time. This is like pre Google, and so like we had books. We're like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen when we heat treat this? It's going to go. It's going to warp. We got to bolt them together. We got to do some things. We we're always trying to figure different things out. I would just say when I'm not asked Rex. Yeah. Yeah. I would have had a problem with that Rex and I are great friends. Oh. So I would have been like, huh? I said, I'm a Rex's yogurt. Do you really? 
Um, okay, so uh, as that moves into, you go into 8620, uh, 6150. 6150 is a lot like for the 4140 ranges. This is 62 uh, or 8620. Um, <clears throat> really good for um, case hardening. We talked a little bit about case hardening. Uh, 52100 has a super high carbon content. How do I know that? The last three numbers are 100 in it, right? So it tell me it's got a lot of carbon in it. So I gotta be really cautious. If I get this thing next to a lighter, I've got a potential to harden this thing, not really. But I mean, it, it, it could get really hard, really fast. It's like a teenager. So um, you wanna just real pay attention to that. Um, move into eight, about 836, you start to move into tool steels like A2, D2, DC53. Um, O1, O1 is an oil quench. Um, S7 um, could be air. Uh, um, it's a great, it's a great alternative for D2. So that's a pretty good point. Sometimes, sometimes you'll you'll find that you can't get certain materials just because of well, like right now, uh, Matt Parker was saying this morning. He's like, hey, did you hear about Guinea? And I'm like, no, I barely keep up with things in Windsor. I'm definitely not paying attention to places across the world. He's like, Guinea just had a big, they just shut all their bauxite mines down. Aluminum is made from bauxite. So that means that aluminum, which has went up about 40% in the past two years, will probably go up about another 80% in the past two months. So what you were buying aluminum for at a buck a pound or whatever you're buying it for, probably gonna get close to about two bucks a pound. So um, like those things matter. And so if my prices on all my, all my material doubled, I can't not make the things that I need to make. I can't just let my Waterloo plant sit by the wayside or I can't just let Ideal Tool just, oh, sorry, we're not taking any bids right now because you know material's high. So if I can't get D2, I've got to look for an alternative. So I've got to have a book like this to help me know what's a good alternative. DC53 is a good alternative. So 4140, 6150 is a good alternative. Um, 01, A2 can be interchangeable. Um, all my low value stuff, W1, which is a water quench, super easy to quench, or super easy to heat treat as well. It's a, it's a good alternative. So it's kind of like knowing the right one. So same thing if you're a house builder. Um, you might want to build the deck out on your house out of cedar because that's the best. But then you get to Lowe's and you're like, whoa, cedar's a lot more than I thought. So what else can I use? What's my alternative? Well, it's not pine two by fours or SPF. So I go to something tree. And so it's about knowing what is the next best scenario for that. Um, that's probably about it on that. Time to, oh my gosh, it's too creepy. Um, okay, here's what we're gonna do. Um, I will not have you guys do the service finish and harvest testing lab today. If you were, <clears throat> if you did not get your, if you are behind on any lab, which some of you are, those things need to be finished today. I will stay here for a little while. I'm working on a project over on the mills and the robot. Um, I'll stay here for a little while, so if you're behind on a lab, I will score all of those things this week. There will be no makeups after that. So in, in four weeks, if you're like, hey, Mr. Tilly forgot this one, I'll do a Tilly close up to you. Um, so you can do that tomorrow. We will start with um, a hardness testing and surface finish lab. Okay. Um, leave the things that I've given you out on your desks. Um, you yeah. need to leave those books there, um, and then we will tackle this stuff tomorrow. All right, you guys are free to go. Have a wonderful day. I think we do.